Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Virtual MOCA. My name is Mia Locks. I am a senior curator at MOCA, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's or tonight's, if you're, if you're calling in from somewhere else from the East Coast, maybe, uh, today's program, which is called Beha Beyond the Walls, a conversation with Berto Lule, Lule uh, Lupe Rosales, Paul Soak, and Rojas, moderated by Richie Reseda. Our speakers are going to talk about the relationship between the prison industrial complex and the immigrant detention system, um, as well as their, their own experiences with art and activism in the face of these brutal systems. I am very grateful uh, to them all for their work and very honored to have them as our esteemed guests. This event is organized by In Plain Sight, which is a coalition of 80 artists led by Castles and Rafa Esparza, united to create an artwork dedicated to the abolition of immigrant detention and the United States culture of incarceration. In Plain Sight is conceived in five parts, a poetic elegy enacted on a, a national scale, an interactive website, um, an anthology docuseries, accessible actions for the public to take to join the movement against immigrant detention, and cultural partnerships like uh, this one with MOCA, producing arts-related education and engagement. Today's event is made possible by MOCA membership, so a really big thank you to our members for your support. If you are interested in seeing more programs like this, I hope you'll support us and become a MOCA member. Uh, MOCA memberships start at $30 a year for people under 30, and you can visit mocha.org for more info. I would now like to introduce the wonderful Kyle Steven from In Plain Sight, who will introduce the rest of today's panelists. Kyle is a Los Angeles-based historian of modern and contemporary art from Latin America and the United States. She organized The Matter of Photography in the Americas, an exhibition of conceptual photography from Latin America at the Cantor Center for Visual Art at Stanford University. She was also the Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow at SFMOMA. As an independent curator, she has organized exhibitions, performances, uh, live multimedia events for international cultural organizations, including the Sao Paulo Museum of Modern Art, Bank of Brazil Cultural Centers, CKM, Red Cat Theater, SF Camera Work, and the British Film Institute, where she was curator of film and multimedia art from 2005 to 2010. So thank you all very much for joining us, and I will pass it off to you, Kyle. Thank you, Mia. Um, this is In Plain Sight's third and final program uh, with the Museum of Contemporary Art. And In Plain Sight would like to thank uh, MOCA and its entire team for supporting as a partner of In Plain Sight, the artist intervention, as well as hosting these cultural programs. Um, we'd particularly like to thank Mia Locks, Brian Dang in the curatorial department, Ava Seda in the communications team, Brian Barcina the, in public programs, and Sam Vasquez in development for supporting our vision and assisting with these programs. I'd also like to acknowledge members of the In Plain Sight team who made this program tonight possible. Um, first, I'd like to thank Rafa Esparza and Castles, um, who are the lead artists of In Plain Sight and who have guided the vision of the project, and my co-curator of public programs, Paulina Lara. I'd also like to thank our designer, Charles Hickey, and our social impact team, Rebecca Lichtenfeld and Set Hernandez Ronquillo. For those of you new to um, In Plain Sight, I'm going to share a little bit about it before we start our panel discussion. In Plain Sight is a coalition of 80 activists, artists, and organizers co-founded by Ross uh, Russell's <laughs> Castles and Rafa Esparza united to create an impactful poetic work in support of the abolition of immigrant detention and the U.S. culture of incarceration. Over Independence Day weekend this past July, In Plain Sight launched the nation's sky plates to spell out artist generation messages in water vapor, which were legible for miles. These messages were typed in the sky over detention facilities, immigration courts, borders, and other sites of historic relevance across the nation, from New York to El Paso to Los Angeles. As the plane soared, they made visible in the sky what is too often unseen and unspoken on the ground, the appalling and profoundly immoral imprisonment of immigrants. IPS broke through this wall of secrecy using art as a form of public engagement to expose sites of detention centers often hiding in plain sight for local communities. 
Each SkyType phrase was followed by the hashtag XMAP, which led viewers to an interactive website where they could locate detention facilities in their vicinity and take action to abolish ICE. In its social engagement efforts, Implant Site is distinguished from many artist projects by its close work with the social impact team and its priority of following the lead of impacted communities and movement partners with active campaigns. We have 17 organizational partners, and I encourage you after the program to visit our website, xmap.us, to learn more about them, as well as accessible actions you can take to join the movement against immigrant detention. Tonight, in our third and final program hosted by MOCA, Beyond the Walls, we will discuss the Immigration Detention Center in relation to the criminalization of black and brown people and the larger for-profit culture of incarceration in the United States and explore how personal, familial, and community experiences of incarceration have shaped the groundbreaking art and activism of our featured speakers, several of whom participated in In Plain Sight over the July 4th weekend. Tonight's panel will be moderated by, Rick, by Richie Reseda. Freed from prison in 2018, Reseda is a producer and abolitionist feminist organizer. He founded Question Culture, a social impact record label who recently teamed up with Justice LA, Schools Not Prisons, and Reform LA Jails to produce Defund the Sheriff, the album, to bring national support to defend, defund the sheriff campaigns across LA County, to invest in alternatives to incarceration, to end the use of taxpayer dollars, to pay for sheriff lawsuits, and to stop the criminalization and incarceration of black and brown people. He also founded Success Stories, a transformational feminist program for incarcerated men, chronicled in the CNN documentary, The Feminist on Cell Block Y, and co-founded Initiate Justice, which organizes people directly impacted by mass incarceration to change the laws to end it. He works closely with Black Lives Matter, Inspired Justice, and more to transform narratives and upend systems of oppression. Joining Richie tonight will be Alberto Lule, who is currently enrolled as an undergraduate art major at UCLA and is a participating IPS artist. Alberto came to identify as an artist while serving a 13-year prison sentence in a California prison. About four years into his sentence, he began to look for things that would take him out of the prison space mentally. He noticed that a lot of inmates would exercise in the yard, so he began to do that too. But what really took him out of the prison space was drawing. It was art that made the prison walls disappear. The routine of drawing led to his greater passion for art in general, which led to his curiosity and quest for knowledge through reading philosophy and eventually taking college correspondence courses. Alberto's current, current artwork focuses on mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex in the United States, particularly the California prison system. Using his own experiences of going through the system, he aims to make visible the connections between the prison industrial complex and issues such as immigration, homelessness, drug addiction, mental health, and to draw parallels between prisons and other institutions, including educational institutions. On campus, Alberto is the co-chair of the Underground Scholars Initiative, a group of students composed of formerly incarcerated students, as well as students that have been impacted directly by the California prison system. Guadalupe Rosales, also a participant in IPS, is a Los Angeles-based artist who received her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2016 and was a 2019 recipient of Gordon Parks Foundation Fellowship and a 2020 USA Artist Award. She is the founder and operator of Better, Betteranus and Rugus and Map Points, two digital archives accessible through Instagram with over 250 subscribers. Aside from these two digital archives on Instagram, Rosales runs and preserves physical archive containing vernacular photographs, flyers, magazines, and other types of ephemera of the 1990s connected to Latinx youth culture in Southern California, and it goes as far back as the 1940s. Guided by an instinct to create counter narratives, Rosales tells stories of communities often underrepresented in the public record and in official memory. By preserving artifacts and memorabilia, Rosales reframes marginalized histories, offering platforms of self-representation. Her work has been featured in exhibitions at the Aperture Foundation, the Vincent Price Museum, the Commonwealth and Council, Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, among others. 
Her work has been featured by The New Yorker, The LA Times, The New York Times, Art News, Artsy, and Art Forum. Paul Soak is an organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition in Los Angeles. A child of Cambodian refugees, he was incarcerated for 17 years, only to find himself ensnared in the immigration enforcement system upon his early release. In 2018, California Governor Jerry Brown acknowledged all of his civic engagement efforts, pardoning him and allowing him to remain in his community to help others. Recently, Paul has organized young people in a successful campaign urging the LA County Board of Supervisors to establish a strong oversight commission that will hold the probation department accountable to both youth and adults. He is dedicated to transforming the systems that restricted his freedom for most of his adult life. He sees the intersections between his experiences as a Ca Cambodian refugee pushed into the school to prison pipeline and all of the other communities of color facing criminalization and deportation. Finally, Rojas is a co-founder of Me Too Behind Bars and also an IPS artist. Me Too Behind Bars is a campaign to expose and end gender-based violence against transgender, gender non-conforming and queer people inside California prisons. The campaign began following a lawsuit that was filed against the California Department of Corrections by four plaintiffs who, at the time, were incarcerated at the Central California Women's Facility. Plaintiffs all identify as transgender, gender non-conforming, or queer. The Me Too Behind Bars lawsuit and the broader campaign aims to recognize these assaults as part of a larger pattern of excessive force by prison staff targeting gender and sexual deviants, and prisons themselves as a form of gender-based and sexual violence. It also aims to create a platform for currently and formerly incarcerated people to connect and respond to this type of violence. I wanna thank each of our panelists tonight for sharing their stories and for their, and their artistic and organizing work with us. For the audience at home, we'll be having a small uh, public Q&A session after the panel concludes. So you can drop your questions in the Q&A box um, and we'll return to these at the end. And now I'll turn the panel over to Richie Reseda. Thank you. Hey. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you so much, Mia and Mocha, um, for having this amazing panel today. Um, thank you to all the artists for being here as well. Super excited to get into it with y'all. I know that these topics of um, immigration detention and the criminal justice system can be really heavy for folks, and we want to hold those realities while also holding the victories of what y'all have been able to accomplish, both uh, with In Plain Sight and all of your work. But first, let's just start with who you all are. Um, if you could tell just a little bit, I, I know your stories go so deep um, and are so important for folks to hear, but if you could just tell a little bit of your stories and how you came to be who you are today and do the work that you do, how you're impacted by these systems. And we will start with Rojas. Hey fam, thank you for introducing me. Um, so I'm Rojas, y'all. I am from Compton. So, you know, I grew up in Compton in the 80s and 90s. Um, I'm formerly incarcerated. I was incarcerated 15 years. While I was incarcerated, I started organizing around gender-based um, violence. I was sexually assaulted, harassed, and um, beat by the officers. So after that incident, I really started organizing because trust that this is not just happened to me. This like happens every day to a lot of folks that are GNC, trans, and like, um, and queer, like we're punished for it. Um, not saying that it doesn't also happen to women too that are cis women, but it's, it's just the way it happens to us is a lot different. We're all often punished for being who we are. Um, so I am the lead organizer at the Young Women's Freedom Center, and I'm also and I'm the founder of the LA chapter. Also, um, I started Me Too Behind Bars when I got out three years ago. Started that campaign, so I don't know. <laughs> Check. That's about it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rojas. Um, Berta? 
Hey, how's everyone doing? Um, so yeah, I got, I, uh, I kind of began like, um, this, this kind of life I'm leading right now, like almost immediately, as soon as I, I paroled in 2016, um, I guess before that, right before I was going to parole, I really had to like kind of come to terms with what was going to happen uh, when I got out. And I know that, you know, if, if, any, if anyone's ever been incarcerated, um, even if it's for a, a small amount of time, you always have that hanging over your head. Like, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? Because when you, when you parole, a lot of people, especially if you've done a good amount of time, you parole with like nothing, right? A lot of people don't know what it feels like to have absolutely nothing. Um, after 13 years, I had uh, $200 that, that, the, that the prison gave me. Uh, I had, I had, other than that, I had no money. I had no possessions, just kind of like what I paroled with, which was, um, I didn't even have an ID. I had no ID, I had no possessions, I had no money, I had no credit, I had no job, I had no friends. Uh, you know, you know, after a while, like the only, the only person that was answering my calls was, was my mother. Um, so so you, you, really, you really look inward, like, what, what am I gonna do? What, what's gonna happen? Um, but I, I think I always knew, like, in the back of my mind, like, that education was the one thing that, that I could do and really, like, use it to, to change my life. So maybe, maybe, like, a week after I paroled, I, I enrolled in a community college in, in Santa Barbara uh, and just focused, um, really developed strategies. Uh, to uh, stay on the campus, which is which is one of the things that uh, the Underground Scholars Initiative really tries to focus on is like uh, developing strategies on how to like stay in school, how to maintain um, the that that mindset. And I just stayed focused. I stayed in school. I eventually um, got accepted to UCLA. Uh, uh, I also got accepted to the UC Berkeley. Like shout outs to the underground scholars at UC Berkeley. Um, but it's really just kind of like uh, how the education uh, that I wanted to pursue kind of saved me from, from doing these other things that a lot of people, when they get out, they really have no, they have like almost no choice. I mean, I know like everybody has a choice to do something, but when you're kind of forced into a position where like you have to do certain things, um, that's kind of like where the underground scholars kind of comes in, where, where uh, we're trying to develop a, a prison to school pipeline and dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Um, so I, I, I just kind of leave it at that. Cool, thanks, Berto. Uh, Guadalupe? Hi, everyone. Um, feeling grateful to be here with everyone here. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's, um, how did I, how can I introduce myself? I guess I'll tell you like a little bit of my background. I, I grew up in, in East LA in Boyle Heights area. And, um, I was always like, you know, I had like a really tight community and, um, I was part of like, you know, growing up, it was a lot of like sub subcultures going on, you know, like the the party scene and then also um i also like experienced a lot of violence around me but for the most part it was a really tight community where i felt like home you know like it felt that i i i loved everything about it and then um in the mid mid 90s things started to change for me where i started experiencing and witnessing a lot of violence around me you know and then um, a lot of gang violence and state violence. And I also lost family members because of that. And I ended up leaving LA in 90, I would say 99, 2000, I was, I was just turning 20. And um, when I did that, I, there was almost like this like sense of uh, like survival mechanism for me, which is something I didn't know at the time. Um, for me, it was more like, 
you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to survive? But everything was happening so fast that uh, I think I met someone at a party who was visiting and they were like, you should come visit uh, New York. And I took that as, as an opportunity for me to, to leave. And, you know, like my experience being in New York wasn't like what you see in like in movies, like, you know, like this like fantasy or this this idea, like I'm going to go to New York and like, um this like the big apple and like you know like you're a tourist there for me it was like i don't even know what new york looks like and at the same time i don't actually care uh that was it's also like the first time leaving la um besides you know going to trips to mexico with my family um and i didn't know anyone there i i probably knew one person um and i only had like a one-way ticket and I was thinking that I was just gonna be there for maybe, I don't even know actually. So a week turned into a month, a month turned into a year. And then I'm like taking like these random jobs um, and not making a lot of money, but I was surviving. And the other thing is that when I left LA to New York, I pretty much had what I was wearing and a stack of wallet size photos with me. and. Um, I also like didn't graduate high school, you know, I, I didn't have a diploma or anything like that. So, which made things really hard. And so like living in New York, I started, um, you know, becoming part of like the art scene. Uh, I found a, a new community, you know, which was another way of identifying, which was my queer, the queer community. Um, and most of the people that I was hanging out with had gone to school, had gone to like an art school, had some sort of privilege. Most of them were white. And I started feeling more like an outsider, like, okay, like I found this community, but where, how do I identify in that? And then I started missing home uh, because also when I left LA, I didn't want to call home. I didn't want to like have a, a relationship with my family, with friends um there was also like a lot of pain you know and in some ways there was a lot, also like a lot of anger and resentment so i was like fuck this i i want to start from scratch so i started missing home and then you know i ended up spending 15 years in new york so i started doing like some research on you know my upbringings like east l.a l.a um being a person of color and everything that I was seeing on the internet was like the stereotype, you know, like the, per like the way people describe us as like in movies or um, things that get appropriated. And I felt like, okay, like there's still something missing then. Cause I, I can't, I don't really fit in that. Um, it feels really shallow. And I also started feeling like if I'm feeling this way, then there are other people who are having a similar experience. So then in uh, 2015, I started these two platforms on Instagram, Veteranas and Lucas and Map Points. And when I started that, I mean, this is like before I even started, I started, um, I got really interested in poetry and art. And I found I, I felt like these were almost like gateways for me to process difficult things, you know, like like trauma or grief or anything like that. And this is why I really started enjoying um, art and also a way to uh, find education and 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 also like realizing that I was that I love learning, you know, like everything that I experienced in high school was almost like. It made me feel like I wasn't interested in school. So then art kind of taught me differently. Um, so now I have these two Instagrams where people submit images and do like, it's a form of self representation and changing narratives and, and how uh, people of color or Latinx are, are being represented on, on mainstream media, on books, in academia, um, and so on. So that's that's my description. That's amazing. Thank you, Paul. Hey, for sure. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I think my experience differs much from a lot of folks. Um, 
you know, Alberto was talking about parole. I didn't get the parole. I didn't get to see my $200. Um, you know, I went in at 17 back in the late 90s, caught 23 years, eight months, you know, um, basically because society decided to put money into badges and firearms on the street corners, right? And when I walked out my door, um, didn't provide me with a youth center down the block or nothing like that, right? They chose to put gang units on the corner. You know, so when I step out the house, it's, hey, lift up your shirt, get on the hood of this car. Who are you? You know, those type of things, right? So I uh, ended up getting caught up in the criminal legal system. Uh, 17, caught 23 years, eight months. You know, I hadn't even been alive that long. And just sitting there and kind of absorbing all that, right? Like, what does it mean to get a sentence longer than you've been alive? What does it mean to make memories um, as an adult and having more of those of being incarcerated than uh, being alive, right? So those are questions I had to grapple with and deal with as I went into the prison system, but I ended up going in. And unfortunately, because of folks out here working on legislation, working on policies and working on dismantling stuff, uh, you know, I got a shot at pro board um, that came out of nowhere. And unfortunately, you know, I got found suitable, but suitable wasn't like, you get to walk home on the day you get out. You know, suitable for me was walking into another tank, watching people go home. Suitable for me was watching people get put, you know, in another van that I had to walk into with chains, um, have another contractor come in, kind of arrest me. That couldn't even arrest me. They didn't even have the lawful right to. You know, release for me was uh, where CDC voluntarily handed me over to, to immigration, right? The polymedia complex, if you want to call it that. Um, and so I got caught up in that. Ended up in, you know, what folks call immigrant detention center to me. Um, it's just another prison. Uh, it's just another jail. It's a migrant cage. It's not a place for detention. It's a place to walk up. It's a carceral piece of the system um, for folks that don't have status or in some ways, whatever that the government has said, you're not welcome here anymore um, inside of these borders. And so that's more of my experience. Um, but fortunately, um, through some risk taking, I was able to make it out uh, after some time in one of these migrant prisons. Um, but I didn't make it out as a free person. So my first day into the world as an adult, I was in my mid thirties. Uh, going to sit on a planner outside the door, having been escorted out by a nice agent uh, with a laundry bag of some property in one hand, with uh, pro papers in one hand, with a deportation order in the other hand, and with an order to report to ICE somewhere in between the two hands. And that was my first free breath into the world as an adult. Um, and so I think my experience is gonna differ from many folks from a different place, um, having to absorb all that. You know, when I came out, I made it to South Central. Um, you know, I couldn't go get a job. I couldn't work because I needed to get a work permit, you know, um, for the fact that I lost all my status. So now it's just another name and number continually um, waiting on a, a plane to come. And so I was out. I was out for about three months. Uh, I got a letter in the mail. I said, you got to come and report. I was like, well, here's my plane ticket, basically. Um, so I essentially went to ICE, uh, basically turned myself in for a plane ride uh, to a country that I had never even been in, inside of Cambodia. Uh, you know, my family had fled Cambodia to go find safety, much like folks do coming from South America, Central America. You know, oftentimes folks think of borders between here and Mexico, that's about it. There's borders all across the world that are man-made. You know, my family went and walked across landmines to find safety, right? Um, and that's where my parents met inside those camps inside Thailand. So I was born in Thailand. I'd never been in Cambodia, but here I am getting scheduled for a flight to a country I've never physically been inside of. Um, and so while I was waiting for that flight, folks that I had met from the community came through, started visiting, you know, came to just encourage me, whatever. But then I had folks that said, well, you know what, if you know how to do something, bro, do it. Fight your case, whatever you know. We don't know nothing. We don't know jack squat. You know, I had lawyers come to me, they're like, I'm not an immigration attorney. I don't know about anything about this, but if you know how to do something, do it. You know, I'll show up, use my bar card to give you cases, whatever you need, right? Help you do some research. And so I essentially struck a deal with folks. I said, man, ICE told me two weeks, my plane ride is here. You know, I was like, man, if that two weeks doesn't come and the plane ain't here yet, I'll, I'll do something. Um, and so I stuck true to that. Uh, I ended up in Louisiana after I filed. Uh, did a very interesting uh, kind of legal maneuver that 
trained lawyers that tell me to this day, like, man, I spent $120,000 in law school. I could have never figured that out. Could have never imagined doing what you did to get out. But I did that on my own from inside of a cage, inside of a box. Because, um, you know, in that system, you don't get an attorney. You know, you got all the resources of the U.S. government against you to get you out of here. And you got nobody to defend you. You're on your own. You either got one, got an attorney for you, pro bono, you paid for one, or you just solo. And so for me, it was just solo, uh, representing myself, but with community support, just to keep my spirits up, keep my hopes up. Um, so I ended up in Louisiana. I uh, ended up coming back to California, got my case reopened, um, do some legal maneuvering. Um, but in any case, I ended up getting a bond hearing, had to fight for that too, but I got it. Um, judge issued a bond and you know I was a, when in when I was 17 came out of my mid-30s had only been out three months where am I gonna find this money um, and so you know I got on the phone talked to a friend of mine former lifer he said man what happened I was like man I got bond he's like man how much I told him he said man I'll get you half tonight you get the other half you figure it out I got you half right now um, and so that was the start of that and that community came through with the other half and got me out. Um, and with ICE, it's not a, you pay 10%, you gotta pay every single penny down to the dollar in one check. That's how it works. If you got a $100,000 bond, you need to raise $100,000 and you need to give it to them in one check. Um, so that, that's just that system. It's a wholly different uh, complex. It's a whole nother profit system that is beyond prisons. Um, but anyways, they ended up making it out. Thankfully for that bond. Um, and so I got out today, like literally the end of the month uh, of November 2016, you know, that was elections. So folks, imagine what I saw inside, you know, when I saw folks just crying and screaming, going to their phones, family started visiting more, people were scared because they saw this administration coming. Uh, and when I came out, it was that same fear that I saw out here. The palate that I used to see around the corner, didn't see anymore. You know, moms used to walk their kids to the library, it was across the for me, didn't see them anymore. Right, so I saw that same thing. Um, and that's when I got involved with organizing work, got him plugged in with the LA Justice Fund, kind of became the central kind of person of that when they started talking about car routes and exclusions, uh, providing people deportation defense attorneys, removal attorneys um, at government express at public expense through the county. But you know, if you got a record, you're asked out. And so unfortunately, I was the person that was asked out. Um, but from there, uh, I got plugged in, met a bunch of young people, <laughs> Met folks at YJC, um, and they were like, man, we don't know what to do, but whatever you need from us, we're here for you. Um, and so they gave me the whole entire platform. And because of that, I was able to get to Governor Jerry Brown, I was able to get a pardon in record time. When his staffers actually sent me an email and they said, read what's in bold, and then what's in bold said, yeah, ain't been out 10 years yet, good luck. And never responded to me ever again. Uh, so it's the work of young people providing a platform. And to be honest with you, a lot of other organizations shut me down. They said, well, you gotta wear a suit and tie, you gotta be with us for a few years before we'll make that ass for you. You know, I got a lot of that. But the young folks, they opened up their hearts, opened up the doors, brought me in. Um, and so that's how I got plugged into that space. And that's how I got into this work um, and working on crime-based deportations for the most part. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing, Paul, and thank all y'all for sharing your story. So given that you all have come from um, being impacted by the criminal legal system, being impacted by the immigration system, or coming from over-policed communities that are impacted by these systems. What does something, a, a project like IPS, mean to you? Um, for those of you who participated in it, what did that mean to you? And, and, and for those of you who, who do similar work and got to see these things written in the sky, what did IPS mean to you? Um. I, I can answer what it meant to me. Uh, you know, it's like, shit, four years ago, I was getting like kicked in the face and stripped of all my clothing and being threatened with rape, y'all, and just literally just for being me. Um, damn. Like to have to look down because there's 14 officers like spitting on me, beating me, and like trying to fight that. And 
like four years later to look up in the sky and see me to my bars. Shit. Like it was fucking amazing, you know? It meant everything to me and everyone else that's in this fight. Like to be able to share that experience and like folks that didn't get to see it, you know, on the inside, to be able to share that with folks. Like, I can't even explain that feeling, man, just to be a part of this whole project. Like, it was like, yo, people people care. We're out here fighting for y'all. Like, we're, it's not over, you know? And, and this is just the beginning, and we ain't giving up. Like, it was fucking amazing. I don't even know it. Like, what are the words to use, you know, it's me. But, like, I just like that feeling so hard to explain. Like, I was sobbing, just like, damn, like, this is how far we came, you know? I just remember folks from CCWP coming in, like, to visit and just organizing on the inside. And, like, it's fuck because this happens all the time, you know? And ain't nobody telling our stories. So, to see it in the sky. It's unbelievable. It felt so good. Berto, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it was it was amazing. Um and it was also very um I guess I guess it was very like 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 a very a very very rude awakening. Um uh because you know I come I, I come out and you know I'm like I'm like aware of these things, right? Um but uh, like, for example, like I drove down to where, to where, uh, the facility that was assigned to me to do the sky writing, uh, which was Otai, Otai Mesa over there. It's like on the, almost on the border of, of uh, the Southern border of uh, San Diego County. And, um, I think Mexicali is right next door. Mm-hmm. And, and we're going and we end up in back of the semi truck and the semi truck has a big, huge PIA on it. Right. Uh, so if anyone's been busted, uh, PIA is the Prison Industrial Authority, right? And this is like a what I call like an entity of the prison industrial complex. And on the PIA uh, 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 semi truck is like the phone number. So if you want to if you want to buy stuff, and I think they hire people out here also. But the PIA uses inmates to make things to work, right? There is basically for slave wages, even below slave wages, right? I got, I got paid like eight cents an hour. When I, when I, and I'm pretty sure Fowl probably didn't get paid anything, right? So it just gets like, it, it, get, it gets so like uh, unbelievable, right? You try to explain these types of things to people and they, they, they're not gonna believe you, especially people that are highly privileged that don't really like, they don't think of these things. Um, so we're driving, we're driving to Otai to, to film the, uh, the sky riding and this huge semi PIA is going to RJ Donovan which is one of the facilities in the area. And we go and like, you know, the Otai is like, it's a small town and pretty much the only thing there is four, four different facilities, right? There's Otai makes it the detention center, the ICE facility. There's, there's RJ Donovan, which is a level three prison and also uh, a reception center. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's another county jail there. And then there's, there's like, I think there's a level two there, but like the whole area is like nothing but prisons. And it's like, and that's all there is. And that is that town's economy. And then there's like, a, there's like, when you, when you see the map and you see all of these facilities, there's like over 200 ice facilities, right? In the United States, like, and all of these are generating like jobs for people, right? And so it's like, and, and, and I think for a long time, especially in California, uh, it was like a cash cow. It was like money making. It was, it was like a money making scheme that was going on under people's noses, and so like that's that's what is truly amazing. And and then I think about like all of these people that have found each other and are combating this system, trying to take it down. The abolitionists, the artists. The, it's it's us who are going to take it down. It it has to be us because if not, if we just let it run rapid. It's I mean, you already saw what happened. There's more. There's more California prisons than the universities and Cal State's combined. Um, there's more. There's more. There's more. There's more uh, 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 prisons in California than uh, uh, football teams in the NFL. There's. It's just. It's. It's crazy. But at the same time, I do see like pe- people such as the people on this panel 
like really like starting to focus on destroying it because it's it's destroying our people yeah and just to say for folks who are watching who've never heard of PIA if you've ever sat on a chair in DMV if you've ever written on a desk in a Cal State University all the all the furniture in every California state building uh, is made by incarcerated people with PIA and PIA is not part of the government it's a it's a private organization um, that uses incarcerated labor to sell things to the California government this one uh, 80% of American flags, right, that are in every courthouse, every, everywhere, are, are like uh, made by PIA as well. Yeah, a bunch of stuff, dentures, anything, anything that's coming out of the California state government building uh, are, are made by, by PIA. Um, Guadalupe, Paul, what, what did the, the project mean to you? Hi. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to see it in person, but um, when I was invited to be part of a, this project, I was thinking about ways to communicate with people in prisons or in uh, ICE detention centers. Um, and I chose to go with the text, No Son Olvidados, we are, uh, you're, not, you're not forgotten. Um, and I, the reason why I chose this text was because I was thinking a lot about my brother who had done time in, in prison and then got deported to Mexico. And then also like my friends who I grew up with who are also incarcerated and being in touch with them. And something that stood out to me in a letter of a friend that I knew from childhood who's now doing 42 years in, in prison. Uh, we had, you know, been corresponding for quite some time. And, and then in one of the letters, he said to me like, Hey Lupe, uh, I just, you know, I know that maybe us engaging and like having, you know, being, um, writing to each other, <clears throat> it's not going to last. I know people forget about us, you know, and I said, I can know this is true. And that really like stuck with me, you know, because I was like, no, Michael, like, you know, like I'm always going to write to you and, I, and I'm, you know, people are going to be thinking of you and which for, you know, after that, like I, I stopped writing to him and I stopped writing him for, for like a year, but I always thought about those words, you know, and for me, it was really, uh, important to say that to people you know like we're we're still here we're like thinking of you we are trying to use our voices and our work to fight for you fight for your freedom um the other thing about that i wanted to mention in terms of you know like the prison system is that i also think about education and the, the school systems and educational systems um, as someone who was a high school dropout and eventually was able to like get my MFA, you know, without that. But I, I started like, I, I've also started paying attention to, to the schools, how, um, you know, when I think about my teachers, you know, like most of them were white. I had a lot of substitute teachers and I started thinking about my relationship with them. He's like, I actually couldn't have a relationship with them because we didn't have things in common. And if someone had something in common, they were like gone the next day, you know, cause there were substitute teachers. And I actually went to my high school not too long ago. I went back and I noticed that my school now looks like a prison. You know, it has all these gates and fences. And to me, it was like, how is a student, how are youth gonna feel comfortable to like walk into these, you know what I mean? Like they're intimidating. So how can we create spaces where it feels like I wanna be there, I, I want my teachers to like see me, you know? Um, so I feel like the work that we're doing, it's, it's like beyond prison systems and ICE detention centers, like it's like around us, you know what I mean? especially in communities uh, such as like where I grew up, 
you know so my question would be more like well what's going on in these communities even like the the, the police that come to to these neighborhoods in east l.a um in particular where i grew up the relationship that we had with the police was so um almost like manipulative and and they wanted they would call us by our names you know like hey what's up lupe like where why are you not home you know kind of like like messing with us and that was that's how i grew up you know what i mean and my point about this is that i was also raised in a way that people were, would say like if you create a if you commit a crime it's your fault you know and if you get arrested it's your fault like even like in my home my my mom would say that to me she's like if if i go pick you up from the precinct or from you know if you get arrested it's your fault you know and that is something that we almost have to unlearn um collectively and i feel like even like with with the work that i do art has allowed me to question the system in these ways um yeah for sure just from my end um seeing seeing that in the sky just reminded me of a time when i sat in like a 737 uh fully chartered it's a private 737 uh it's just me and two other folks one guy from somalia and another guy from cambodia um traveling uh, across the u.s um reminded me of times like that when it was full of u.s marshals ice agents you know, in a chartered jet, when you think about it, they pay for every seat as if it's full. You pay for all the fuel as if it was full. You pay for everything, right? If you only want to fly one person and it's got 100, you got to pay for all 100, you know, because there's a full flight crew and all that stuff. So it just reminded me of times like that. Reminded me of another time when I was in a DC-10 by myself. You know, again, same situation I saw. It just really taught me about, it just reminded me, not taught me, but reminded me a lot about those things. But, um, but on the, the flip side of that, we have the ability to occupy spaces that were generally unoccupied, right? Spaces that at a point in time when the government was doing that to me, but now folks are out there in that same space, right? We're talking about the atmosphere. And so that just talks about the power of creativity, um, power of community, et cetera, right? To get into kind of the spaces that um, were before forbidden or so far out of range, impossible to reach. So just remind me of our ability as folks, as people, to organize um, and to secure our communities and liberate our people at the end of the day. Hell yeah, thank you. And, and to talk more about that, like what does healing look like for y'all? What are your visions for how to use art, whether it be art organizing or, or any of the tools we have to build communities that serve us and to build healing? I can speak on that. Uh, so, uh, you know, even <clears throat> platforms like Veteranos and Lucas and, and Map Points on, on Instagram, I was really interested in, in how, you know, I feel like the work that, that is being displayed on Instagram is that we are rethinking and, 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 and using these platforms to, to, to like for self representation um it's almost like you know like there have been times when someone will share a photo and i start a conversation with them asking them like so is there a memory or a story that you want to share with 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 us and the world that goes with this image and when that happens it's almost like this like chain reaction because then someone else gets inspired to do the same you know because we start to see each other as examples and also we start to decriminalize ourselves through that action through that act you know like we start to appreciate and feel empowered by doing that and you know i mean it's like as simple as like if i post an image someone will be someone will be reminded like i used to do that do that too or i even dress like that um, and then that starts a conversation where someone will take out their album that they haven't even opened in, in so long, you know, and they start to appreciate and embrace that part of themselves. So I feel like collectively we have been, we've started this movement. Um, 
and people start to like also do self archiving through that you know like I even including myself I remember there were of course there's some there there are images and stories that that are harder you know to digest or to even imagine to think again think about again um but it's all about the process you know like <clears throat> I had to be that drastic to leave LA you know and now I'm in a place where I can talk about trauma and I can talk about things that are really personal but then I also know people who are not there yet you know but still feel inspired to to want to be able to open up that way Can I just say uh, one thing about healing, y'all, what it looks like to me, because I've been trying to heal uh, from all the trauma in my life. And y'all is just like not to romanticize it or make it seem like it's easy. Cause I remember thinking like things was gonna like, oh wow, if I do this healing work, or, I mean like somatic therapy, like, oh, it's like, my life's going to get easier when actually it got a whole lot harder. It's like you got to keep on pushing because you don't realize how much bullshit you have to unlearn. And it's just like, fuck, it's a lot of hard work, but worth it, you know? I, I just, like, had to bring up how hard it was, you know? Like, for me, uh, no lie with different parts of me, like my you know, dealing with anger, dealing, you know, just when I'm sad, you know, us as being people of color, never really being able to say like, yo, that hurt my feelings, you know, and how awkward it is to do that now and to really push yourself and it's like, it's like I'm always like kind of fighting with myself, <laughs> like it's okay to say that, you know, but it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard, but it, it's worth it. You know, that's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, healing is, is hard work. Berto, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I'm you know I'm still kind of like in that in in that in that kind of mode. You know, you're always you're always like really unpacking like at all times like. Like, especially for me, the healing part, a, a lot of it comes for me by kind of like coming to terms with, with all, all of these things that happened. Um, and also not realize, and also realizing that even though a lot of it had to do with like bad choices that I made, that a lot of it also has to do with this design that's happening within our system. Um, you know, when you're when you're a kid, especially you go you grow up and you, you 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 get involved in gangs and crime and all this stuff. It's really hard to like let people know like I'm just like a hurt little boy, <laughs> you know. And, and and instead, I'm just gonna punch you in the face. Like like that's just that those are just things that happen, especially in a city like Los Angeles and other and other places where there's huge amounts of marginalized communities. Like you are taught like very young that that showing those kinds of things is weakness and you can't be weak on these streets. Right. Um, and so it gets, it gets a lot harder growing up, especially, and then you end up in a, in a place where it's nothing but like toxic masculinity, like prison, any, any prison you go to in California, it's always going to be like, like headbutting and, um, trying to, trying to, uh, people just trying to, you know, get over on each other. It's a doggy dog. It's a doggy dog uh, environment. Nobody's going to be like, you know what? I just really want to talk about my feelings today. It just, it doesn't happen. And that's why when I saw the, 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 the feminist on cell block, why it was just like groundbreaking, right? You know, shout out, shout outs to Richie. You guys, anybody that's on this uh, 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 panel discussion today, you need to watch the feminist on cell block. Why it's really just like, I think it's groundbreaking work, uh, especially like for, for, for people suffering from toxic masculinity, which is something that I'm still kind of dealing with, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the type of uh, the, a person that 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 wants to share like deep personal feelings. But at the same time, I know, like for me, it's like it's it's necessary. 
especially to when, I, when I'm talking to younger kids who come in with the attitude, right? They come in with, with, with the, you know, they're, they're crazy, right? They're, they're, they want to be crazy. But at the same time, like, why are they there, right? That's, that's another thing that we do, especially when we do tours of, of younger kids on, on the UCLA campus. They need to see someone like me there. That, that's, that's another thing that we push. Like, you need, to see, you need to see somebody that looks just like your uncle that's in prison. You need to see somebody that's like, that's just like your dad, that looks like your dad, that could be your dad, is as old as your dad, talks just like him, but is in this space, taking up, taking up space in this privileged like campus. Because that is where they see like, you know what? I can do it too. Um, yeah. Uh, the question is healing, right? Um, that reminds me of just when I was like told that my case was over or whatever, you know, my parole was discharged. That was like one thing. Um, and then finally having like not to check in with ICE anymore. Um, you know, so there was a lot of stuff that I had to deal with um, being monitored and all kinds of stuff. But in any case, um, there was a point in time when all that was done, but I physically felt it in my body. Like I had to walk down to 300 North Los Angeles Street. <laughs> Like I had to walk up to the second floor or the seventh floor or whatever it was and go check in again. Like uh, the system, our trauma, our hurts, our pains, and all things embody and manifest within our bodies. They become part of our muscle memory. Um, I used to wake up at 3 a.m. every day. I'm like, man, why do I wake up at 3 a.m. every day? Um, but it reminded me of that. Like in the prison system, 3 a.m. was like Barlock. Let like the kitchen workers out, right? So. I was like, man, there's all these things that, that still stuck and carry through. But I think for me, though, know, for healing overall, um, we have to look at a bigger picture than individuals and peoples. We have to start looking really um, beyond all that, start focusing on the systems that cause folks to be there. Because um, the trauma is not, people don't, people aren't born wanting to hurt people. You look at a two year old kid. They want to climb the walls and get into all the cereal and share with all their friends and their neighbors. That's how we're born. We're not born to pick up guns and knives and go shoot and kill each other. We're not born to be territorial, right? All that comes from the systems, comes from the schools and the way they teach you, how they uplift certain things, how they disparage others, comes from the history books that don't teach you everything that happened, right? It comes from all of that stuff. Um, so we have to look at those things. We have to start thinking about how things are invested, where does money go, you know, what's on the corner to help folks when they need it. You know, for most folks, you walk outside, you ain't got nothing. You got some concrete, you got some asphalt, and you're lucky if it's good if you're in the hood, because chances are it's a pothole right there, and they're never coming to fix it. Those are the things we got to think about. That's when healing really begins, right? That's where healing really begins, um, until we get those type of situations like resolves where it's still going to end up in this cycles, right? Because ultimately at the end of the day, if you think about it, the government puts $10 of resources inside South Central across 10 blocks. Everybody in them 10 blocks is going to fight over them $10. Right? But it's $10 is what they need to survive. If everybody needs us $10, everybody's going to fight for it. So it's not black on black crime. It's not black on brown crime. It's really survival of the fittest because that's what the structures have made for folks, right? That's what people are stuck in. People have to thrive in that. So how can folks really find healing if that's what they're always gonna have to struggle against, right? So we have to really, really, really think about that. And how do we get to a place where folks are supported? Right? A lot of times you think about cages. Oh, what are we gonna do with people that kill each other? Well, I mean, that's not the conversation or the question you should be asking. It's like, how can you support and love folks so they don't go kill each other? It's not what to do when it happens. It's how do we make sure folks are loved and supported so they don't feel the need to do that. Because at the end of the day, it's hurt people that hurt people. Not healthy people, not whole people. Whole and healthy people love people. And that's a problem. The system keeps us broken to be that way. It's, it's the reality of the systems that are there so that we, at the end of the day, can kill ourselves, destroy ourselves, so the white man can thrive. If you look at the first laws of who was the citizen of the United States, it was the free white person. Go look it up from 1790. No lie. It was made for them. It was not made for you or me. It was not made for black folks. It wasn't made for folks that are my skin. You want to call me high yellow, whatever you want to call it. It was not made for us. 
We always have to remember that. That's the real truth. But anyways, not to take up everybody's time. Nah, you good. Thank you. Thank you for, for pointing out the systemic healing that needs to happen that we all need to be a part of as well. Um, Paul, Rojas, Berto, Guadalupe, thank you all so, so much for your work. Um, it ain't over. I'm just thanking y'all because you're amazing and, and this project was amazing and what you bring to our communities is amazing. I'm now going to turn it back over to Kyle um, to moderate the questions from the audience. Thank you so much, all of you, for opening your hearts and sharing your stories and your thoughts about how to heal um, these internal and social traumas. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have come in um, from folks. Uh, I'm gonna start with one from Valerie, who asks, um, has the process of healing, the awakening and unlearning of racist systems been difficult to navigate within the family unit when our families and others in our communities may still be oppressed and have different life or political experiences. Exam for example, brown and black community conflict. So. I think that's a question about how do we deal within our own people, <laughs> um, right. in a sense to me. Um, just from my experience, it has been difficult, especially from the Asian culture. Um, you know, it's a lot about being quiet and just kind of dealing with whatever issues you have, because a lot of folks do come from overseas. Uh, they come from different repressive regimes, et cetera. So they use certain ways, they fear the government. Um, but there's also large amounts of shame that folks deal with. Um, and to be honest with you, I've seen a lot of anti-blackness within Asian communities. I ain't gonna lie. But I've also seen it within brown communities. You know, I've seen anti-Mexicanism within Central Americans. I've seen anti-Central Americans within Mexican. But I've seen it all. Right? And so these are things that we, as our own people, we have to do that for us. The system is not going to do that for us. We have to just get together and like we have to each one teach one, right? The things that we learn, we just have to share with others. We just have to like bring, folk, bring folks in. Um, you know, we just really have to educate our own folks. Um, and so one thing I've shared with a lot of older Cambodian folks um, that made their open their eyes a little bit, like literally they sat there and they were like, I just say, y'all are suffering in silence. Y'all come out at the last minute, but they're putting your son on a plane. I can't do nothing about that. I'm sorry. But all that time you're suffering in silence. Imagine if you had said something. We could have probably figured something out. Who knows what we could have done, right? Maybe we could have bought time or something. But y'all suffered in silence and this is the result and y'all are gonna continue to suffer in silence because y'all ain't gonna talk to nobody else and they sat there and they looked at me. Never asked to talk to me again because it was just the truth and they had to hear it. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, um, that's the importance of truth, right? We just have to just talk about it, open those conversations. Um, especially when our cultures are so closed, we just have to have those conversations. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that, on healing within communities? Um. So I, I really like to, I don't, I don't really, I don't like like focusing on the conflicts, even though I know there's some, I like to focus on kind of like the unifying aspects of some of the programs that have happened. Um, like for me, like there's plenty, there's plenty of like examples that I could talk about where like, where like different communities are kind of like in conflict, but I, there's, there's so many, uh, there's so many also like, like, things that have brought people together, um, such as Black Lives Matter. Like this, that was like, I was there. Like, and it, you know, I was there shouting it. Didn't matter, like it all, because when, when that matters, everything matters, right? And a lot of people are not really understanding it or like have, have they have like some kind of like issue with it. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm like speaking from a point where like, I'm like healing myself and it's hard, it's hard to like, it's hard for me to speak on like conflict when I'm trying to like unify. So I, I rather focus on that. Like, um, but I think, I think like community kind of community tables such as this one, like, which I'm kind of surprised. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of surprised a place like Mocha putting this on, um, <laughs> is, is an example that, that things are happening for the better. 
and I, I you know, I, I don't really, I'm not gonna really comment on any conflicts happening. I'm with that, Berto. I'm with that because they always want to talk about, uh, or they always like social media, any type of media always want to show us fighting each other. I'm from a black and brown community, but they never want to talk about how like we eat together, barbecue together, watch each other's kids, love each other, you know, be there for each other like family. It's like the media like, you know, always wants to just talk about how we kill each other and ne never talk about just us being family, I mean, I come from a diverse family, so it's just, I'm glad you said what you said, because I feel the same way. I don't like, like, just putting negative shit out there, just positive, just all love, y'all. <laughs> when it comes to our communities. We have a question for Alberto um, about your artwork. Um, what is your artwork you're producing now mean to you today, and what is your motivation? Well, a lot, of, a lot of the artwork I'm I'm trying to produce has to do with kind of like um, finding all of these kind of uh, similarities uh, between uh, UCLA and prison. Like I remember walking around the campus and I'm like, you know what, this kind of reminds me like if like this would be kind of like the weakest like yard I've ever been on in my life, right? <laughs> like because when you're, you know, like and it's because I started seeing like little similarities between like what the protocols and guidelines and like what you call due process within the system is, is, is they're very they, there's I started seeing parallels between the two systems one is one is a system uh, an institution of higher learning and one is a correctional institution um, but they're both institutions that and they're both they're both uh, American institutions and and when I started looking at it in that way, I started seeing parallels that that are really interesting. And I'm kind of focused a lot on that right now. Um, and then I'm also kind of focused on more um, kind of like abstract ways of showing um, like psychological trauma. Um, I use like, I use tools that like the police use. Um, I like to use uh, fingerprint powder and fingerprint, like forensic fingerprint like tools to figure out like what's going on. Like try to, I try to do my own investigations on things. I think I, a lot of artwork has to do with that. Like you're investigating something. Uh, they, they're, they're, there's something there and like hidden under or, or, or like underneath, like right under your nose or there's people wearing masks or then, you know, you're trying to find something. And a lot of it has to do with using the tools. You know, you know that the saying that you can't, you can't tear down the master's house with his own tools. But I, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking you could. I'm kind of thinking you could. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, when I hear you talk about the parallels between institutions, something's come up across the panel. Several people have been asking about um, the role of cultural institutions. Um, how do these, how do cultural institutions reflect a carceral logic perhaps in some ways and need to transform? And what do we imagine the role of cultural institutions could be in thinking beyond the prison walls? Uh, I kind of, I could kind of see that as kind of like an anti, like an anti-institution if possible, if there is like a thing, like, you, so you take like the correctional institution and the, 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 I guess the an, an, to, antithesis of that would be the, the uh, cultural institution where like we're kind of combating this. We, we've decided to make this our, our, our bad guy. You know, because a lot of times um, when I, in other panels when I would speak about like um, uh, why like I was getting pulled over all the time, like the first six months that I got out, I was getting pulled over like three times a month, you know, because I was like a new face. Right. They hadn't seen me in a long time. A lot of the cops that that were like that knew me, they were like retired. They were, they, you know, enough time had passed by where like there was new policemen and I was a new face. And like, oh, who's this guy? Like I'm pulling him over. Right. To the point where like where, where I felt like as soon as as soon as they saw me and I saw them, like we both knew what was going down. Right. You just sitting in your car and you, and you see this. You see them. You see the police staring at you. You know what's going to happen to the point where like. Why do I know what's going to happen? 
Um, and that that's kind of like where, where I'm kind of like going with it is like, um, why do or how how do how do like agents of the system right or agents of the institutional systems which are the police uh how do they how do they know who the potential bad guys are or how do you know who the bad guys are where why am i a potential bad guy um and i think like a cultural institution could combat that and i'm not sure if like i even know what i'm talking about right now <laughs> but maybe maybe uh, another another panelist can kind of jump in i wanted to mention again i'm i think this is what you were talking about but i'm just going to like piggyback on that um, there's like a lot of shame in in communities which is also generational that gets passed on um, i can talk about uh something that i've experienced and witnessed and also i've seen the, with the work that i do um and even like in my family uh i i like to think of the archive and the work you know that that i'm doing as th this archive is for the future you know even though we're talking about something that already happened um we need these archives for the future which is also material for the next generation and uh and this 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 thinking started when i actually saw this like i guess some like dumb comments on my instagram that said i bet you anything that these women are all grandmothers now kind of like shaming them or something you know and i actually went back to that comment and said well imagine if our mothers fathers great grandparents would tell us the truth about their ways of socializing their ways of living because everything that even my except from from my experience and hearing my mother tell me parts of her story are like well i don't want to tell you how we socialize because she's already thinking that it's bad you know, so it's almost like this thing that got passed on. And then we grow up thinking that what we did and how we socialized was something that was bad or we started to like criminalize ourselves. Um, so in this way is that like, well, how do we change that narrative? You know, like as an example, my sister and I are really close and we did a lot of things together as teenagers and she's very supportive of the work that I do. and when my niece sees her mother my sister you know on in my work she feels very proud because my sister's really open with her you know and i feel like when we start to feel empowered and kind of like i don't know how people can do this collectively but the shame is something that it's almost like we uh, another thing that we have to unlearn um so that's that's something I wanted to share with everyone. Thank you. Does anyone else have a anything to add to that question? If not, I might close down the public questions and just ask everyone, um, what are you working on right now? And are there any campaigns or projects or anything you'd like to plug? And I'd like to include Richie in this as well. Um, I'd like to hear what he's up to. Um, maybe you can start, Richie. Um, if you in California vote yes on Prop 17, there's a there's a proposition that will be on the November ballot to make it so that people on parole have the right to vote. 50,000 people right now in California don't have the right to vote because they're on California parole, which means they got out of state prison. Um, currently, if, if you get out of the county jail, you can vote. If you get out of federal prison, you can vote. If you get out of state prison, you can't vote. Um, and this, with this, with the assumption that we're talking about folks who are U.S. citizens, folks who don't have citizenship status, also were barred from voting, which is another important issue, but unfortunately, a separate issue that Prop 17 doesn't address. But Prop 17 will make it so that people who are on state parole can vote, um, and which used to be the case before uh, it was changed during the Jim Crow law. So we're trying to fix the old sins of Jim Crow. And that's something folks can go vote on right now. Also, I would just say, like like all the amazing people on this panel and so much of us in, in the art world, I'm always working on a thousand things. Um, I 
it's past my bedtime. I couldn't even tell you what they are. Um, but if you follow me on my Instagram, which I put in my name right here, at Richie Reseda, you can connect to all my organizations and art projects. Great, thank you. Rojas? Well, hey y'all, uh, I'm right now, um, damn, I'm also working on a lot with me too behind bars, our campaign. But uh, maybe I'll speak a little bit about our video storytelling project that we're working on. Um, just us that are formerly incarcerated and been to this gender-based violence. We're a group of mostly trans and Gen Z folks because like ain't nobody ever telling our story y'all like you know um it's especially our trans and Gen Z folks that have been through immigration you know that like <laughs> that have been sent out of this country like I mean, I got folks hitting me up all the time that still want to be a part of this project to tell our stories. And we're just, I mean, if folks could maybe, I don't know, follow me too behind bars and at least be a little interested in what we got going on, um, that would be dope. So we could um, expose the system, for what they do to us and how they punish us literally just for being us just follow me to behind bars and if you want to know any other information about what we're doing um you can email me at rojas at youngwomenfree.org and we're working on a few projects and if anyone likes to get involved or i don't know maybe donate or know some people that would donate or if you're an artist we maybe we could i don't know collab on something and just come up with some ideas to help our folks on the inside. Thank you. Berto? Um, yeah, really, I just kind of want to plug in all, my, all the homies that are part of the Underground Scholars Initiative. Uh, the Underground Scholars Initiative was a student org that started in Berkeley and is now a, a student org in every UC campus. Um, I uh, I ended up uh, choosing to go to UCLA because I actually met like four people on Bruin Day that had been like formerly incarcerated, and to me that's like every that's like my tribe, you know. Like 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 you want to talk about healing too is like find your tribe, find that find that find those people that really make you comfortable, you know. Like for you know like for a while when I when you know when you meet people like and they're street people, uh uh, they make you uncomfortable. I was always uncomfortable. That's why I ended up needing to carry a gun everywhere. I, I was uncomfortable. I thought I was comfortable, but I wasn't, right? It, 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 but uh, the Underground Scholars Initiative really focuses on supporting our, our, our students incarcerated and, and formerly incarcerated on, on UC campuses. Um, and uh, uh, also I wanna give a shout out to the Bruin Underground Scholars Program, which was a program that through 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 the efforts of the Underground Scholars Initiative was is a program uh, to give students that are formerly incarcerated on the UCLA campus resources. Well, it's, uh, that's one of the one one of our well, one of our main aims also is to get as much resources out of that school as possible to our people. That's and that's another thing that we're that we're trying to combat, and it, and it's something that you know all successful like organizations do is like we're trying to get resources for our people. And um, shout outs to Underground Scholars Initiative, the Bruin Underground Scholars Program. So, thanks. Guadalupe? Yeah, so uh, aside from these two digital archives, I also run a physical archive. Um, people also started donating physical material and um, you know, such as photographs, magazines, flyers, clothing, um, ephemera. And that's, you know, I, I also just got a studio and something I've never had in my life. And it's really been really nice. And um, yeah, but also just like diving into this kind of work, uh, I also, I'm seeing how the lack of, of support and resources. Um, you know, uh, 
this kind of archive needs. And which is something that I would love to make it, you know, I want, I want this archive to live for a long time and make it accessible. Um, and I guess if anyone wants to help with that, you know, if anyone has some sort of resource or knows about handling archives, this is something that I've also learned through the process. Um, just send me a message. I, I can use the help in that way. Uh, it's, it's really great that this, this archive is going to keep growing. So, so I'm pretty confident about that. Thank you. And uh, Paul, did you have any campaigns or youth justice coalition news? For sure. Um, so there's a couple of campaigns. Um, we've been trying to do a fundraiser for a while. Uh, so a while back, I was able to get $10,000 um, through philanthropy uh, to a friend that we were able to get out to the ground for strictly for undocumented families during COVID. Um, so we put out an application process. Um, we got way too many than we could support. So we need another uh, 50,000 to support the rest. Um, and so a lot of them are really struggling. You got mothers and all kinds of stuff. It's really hard to read those applications, but um, so that's something that we got going on. You can check it out on uh, our website. There's a button, if you look under donate, there's like an option to donate to undocuate. That's particularly what we've called it. Um, or you can go to our Instagram at Youth Justice LA. The link tree is in the bio, takes you to different things. Um, you can look for one, donate to uh, undocumented families during COVID, so it's also there. Um, so all of that money is going straight to the community, um, straight to supporting families with a gift card. Some of them have said, hey, we just need to buy milk for our, our kids. Some of them were like, man, I need to buy some, some medicine for my, my diabetic parent, you know? So we get a lot of those type of requests. Um, so that's part of it. Um, but something that came up earlier today on my radar, there's a young woman that's 26. She's gonna be paroling, I believe tomorrow, um, but she's got an ice hold. So folks are asking uh, that people would call the governor, uh, call Ralph Diaz, uh, CDCR secretary, to tell them to don't hand her over. She's 26, she's from Mexico, uh, Nayela. Unfortunately, she's in much of the same similar situation as I was. Um, and so that's also in our link tree. You can find all kinds of stuff in there. Um, check that out. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we put that information about the undocuate campaign that Paul's talking about in the chat box. And tomorrow on the Mocha IG, we'll also be um, pushing out some information about that. So please donate if you can to support families who are undocumented um, during COVID. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody on the panel today for this fabulous exchange. Um, thank you to Richie for moderating, Paul, Rojas, Berto, and Guadalupe for their thoughts and um, stories. We really appreciate um, your participation. I'd also like to thank MOCA for their extended partnership um, with In Plain Sight and for hosting these three public programs that have given us an opportunity to delve deeper into some of the issues around the culture of incarceration in the US. Um, I'd like to add that In Plain Sight um, is going to be continuing its social impact campaign through the next year. We have more um, upcoming fight, flight paths, um, on the ground mobilizations and arts related programming. So you can tune in to xmap.us, our website, and we have a calendar of events there. Also, if you are involved in um, immigrant justice movements and would like to post an event um, on our website, um, there's another, uh, there's a place there where you can alert the community and the coalitions we've brought together about your events. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we hope you stay tuned to In Plain Sight. Thank you all for attending tonight. Good night.